Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome back after our short bio break. Uh, welcome again to our joint symposium uh, between Center for Values and Sir Poise. Um, we're glad that all of you could have joined us today. And uh, we're getting ready for our next talk uh, um, uh, given by Matthew Brown on expert authority, autonomy, uh, uh, expert authority and autonomy, epistemic anarchism or strong accountability. Matt. OK, uh, thank you, Magda. Um, uh, so apologies that I'm here instead of our scheduled speaker, um, but uh, I look forward to talking to you a little bit about um, expert autonomy and uh, authority. I'm, I'm sort of building here off of, uh, I think, underappreciated um, discussion by uh, Heather Douglas in the beginning of her book from 2009, Science Policy and the Value Free Ideal, um, and then going off um, uh, in some um, various directions with that. So um, let me just start by giving you the argument of the talk. Um, it, it goes like this. Um, so uh, first, uh, science is traditionally understood to be both authoritative about public matters to which it is relevant and autonomous from social interference, um, though not social guiding, but there's a certain level of social interference which is supposed to be autonomous from. Um, number two, authority and autonomy are prima facie incompatible features of public institutions in democratic societies. Um, so, so uh, democratic institutions are not supposed to be both authoritative and autonomous. Uh, Science is traditionally understood to be compatible with both because it is objective and impartial in the relevant sense. Um, and typically this is um, uh, understood to include at least the idea that it is value free. Um, but science is inevitably value laden. It is not impartial. The scientist qua scientist makes value judgments and uh, uh, it is not therefore objective or impartial in the relevant sense. So science cannot be both authoritative and autonomous. Um, the role of science in society, as traditionally understood, uh, is unworkable in a democratic, in a properly democratic society. Um, our, thus, our options are: a) give up the authority of science and embrace what uh, I'm calling epistemic anarchism; give up the autonomy of science and embrace um, a strong public accountability for science, or some combination or, or middle path of some sort. Um, and although I don't have time to argue this today, these considerations should lead to our reevaluation of some core issues of socially relevant philosophy of science, such as um, uh, the evaluation of scientific consensus, public understanding of and trust in science, uh, the role of citizen science, uh, the notion of evidence-based policy, um, and so on. All right, so that's the general argument. Um, let's see about some of the details. Um, first, the authority of science. The authority of science is visible everywhere from the special treatment of scientific experts as witnesses in legal proceedings to the role of prominent experts in the media um, to the use of expert testimony and scientific evidence in policymaking. Um, we can understand the, what the authority of science is or what it means to say that science has authority roughly as the power of science to demand deference to or acceptance of its claims for public purposes. Um, even the folks we are inclined to call uh, uh, science deniers do not frame their own positions as anti-science. Debates in, instead pursue, proceed in terms of whose science is the sound science, whose science is the junk science, and so forth. So the, the authority of science is, by most, uh, considered a, a shared um, premise in the discussion. Now, the autonomy of science. Um, we tend to um, uh, decry any encroachment on the autonomy of science. Um, the freedom of research uh, is something we hear a lot about. There's a, there's a United Nations declared right to science 
um, that uh, includes a, a sense of non uh, non encroachment on its autonomy. Um, it's frequently declared on the basis of um, well of anecdote and rumor primarily that violation of the autonomy of science would kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Uh, right, uh, so Vannevar Bush in Science: The Endless Frontier makes this argument, um, but you various it's very various people have made it in various ways. Um, now, um, uh, I I believe that authority and autonomy conflict in the context of a democratic society. Um, there's a prima facie conflict between uh, an institution having authority and it having autonomy. So authority, authoritative institutions can tell you what to do, right? Including what claims to accept. Um, uh, so if it, it's, a, it's the kind of authority that tells you what kind of claims to accept, it's an epistemic authority, right? Um, and in a democratic society, legitimacy of authority depends on some appropriate relationship to the people or the public. Um, uh, and that relationship typically violates the notion of autonomy that we've traditionally associated with science. Um, so here's Heather Douglas uh, talking about this issue uh, early on in science policy and the value free ideal. Um, and uh, she argues that an autonomous and authoritative science is intolerable for if the values that drive inquiry um, are inimical to society, the surrounding society is forced to accept the science and its claims with no recourse. A fully autonomous and authoritative science is too powerful with no attendant responsibility. Um, now, uh, the, the trick that's supposed to sort of resolve the tension um, in the traditional conception of science is objectivity and a partiality, right? Because science is thought to be objective and impartial between political actors, between different values and value perspectives, um, it's thought that science could be both authoritative <laughs> and uh, and autonomous. Um, scientists on this view have only truth as their motive. Uh, they present only uh, the facts in an unproblematic sense. And so they can be trusted and deferred to without moral or political hazard. Um, but it's going to surprise no one uh, listening today uh, uh, that there, there are problems with this traditional conception, right? Um, the, the main problem being that science is, um, is value laden and so is neither objective nor impartial in the relevant sense um, because uh, insofar as it is relevant for democratic decision-making for any kind of public decisions, um, science is deeply value laden with uh, values that are, are at issue. Um, and there's many arguments for this. Uh, probably the one that is the most um, impactful on the current debate in this general area is the argument from inductive risk, due uh, especially to the work of Heather Douglas, um, which I'm I'm not going to review this argument for the purposes of time. Many of you will already be familiar with it, um, but uh, it it trades on um, uh, inductive risk. The riskiness of inductive inference as uh, as an area where values can play a significant role. There's a, a variety of other important arguments um, uh, for this as well. Um, uh, other places where um, the value ladenness of science comes through. Um, and uh, um, you know, many others have talked about this, so I'm not going to, to review any of those arguments. What instead I want to review is um, a widespread objection, or uh, maybe not widespread, but significant objection to uh, the value ladenness of science, um, which I'll call the democratic objection to values in science. Um, and this uh, this is the idea that if if value if science is value laden, then it presents a significant a threat to democracy. Um, and it seems to me that this argument uh, is, is, is is strong. It's a strong, it's a strong argument. It's a serious consideration. Um, so Gregor Betts, for example, um, worries that uh, about democratically illegitimate influence of scientific experts. 
when he says that as political decisions are informed by scientific findings, the value-free ideal ensures in a democratic society that collective goals are determined by democratically legitimized institutions and not by a handful of experts. According to Betts, value-laden science poses a serious problem of democratic legitimacy, at least if we don't have um, uh, uh, some way to, uh, to avoid this, this concern. Similarly, um, uh, Liam Kofi Bright uh, unpacks an argument uh, from W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, where Du Bois defends the value-free ideal. Um, by arguing that the public trust of science depends on scientists being motivated by, uh, uh, quote, the pure desire to ascertain the truth. Um, and Bright sees Du Bois as agreeing with Betts, that the scientists should simply present information and leave decisions and value judgments to the policymaker. Um, now, I think that uh, Betts and Du Bois um, and Bright uh, uh, have, make a serious point, raise a serious concern um, in favor of the value-free ideal. Um, but the, the objection that they're raising does not really touch the heart of the argument that value judgment is central to any type of uh, it, what I might call amplitive inference in science, which is ubiquitous. Um, so I, I think part of the issue is that um, the focus deriving from the original formulation of the inductive risk argument by Richard Rudner, say, um, or in the way that it was considered by other figures or earlier in the history of philosophy of science, um, has, has focused too much on accepting or rejecting hypotheses in particular. Um, and so uh, proponents of the, of the democratic objection, um, like those um, that have purely epistemic objections to value-laden science, um, have typically responded to critiques of the value-free ideal by arguing that um, uh, value-laden decisions can be deferred to policymakers, right, or to decision makers who are using the science. Um, but the many of these arguments that I've just mentioned uh, have shown that value judgments cannot be deferred in this way, right, um, because any information one might present itself involves uh, you know, risky amplitude inferences and trade-offs between types of error um, and conceptually, you know, value-laden concepts um, or, or terms uh, or claims. Um, so uh, we have we have a kind of, I think, um, stalemate in the argument, right? On the one hand, um, to those bringing the political democratic objection, the situation seems uh, intolerable to have value-laden science. On the other hand, um, the, uh, uh, the proposal to, to, to render science value-free is, is, is unworkable. Um, you, get, you get kind of complex and unwieldy accounts of how you might defer value judgments that in practice, I think, are just not going to work. Um, nevertheless, I think, um, uh, what the democratic objection, you know, uh, focuses our attention to is the question of whose values, right? Um, whose values are going to play a role? And I think, you know, what one of the things that's driving the democratic objection is a presumption in favor of the autonomy of science, um, because the autonomy of science suggests that it's up to the scientists to make the value judgments, um, and that's, you know, that's an obvious. Um, that's an obvious problem. Um, in other words, the use of science and policy seems to require um, expert judgment, right? The relative judgments that the experts make are both technical and evaluative, right? Moral and political. Um, and uh, uh, there, there seems to be um, a problem. If we want science-based policy, value-laden expert judgment seems unavoidable. Um, uh, and one of the reasons is we we can sort of understand scientific experts themselves as um, special interests, right? If they're not um, uh, uh, authorized, publicly authorized, or publicly accountable decision makers within the framework of democratic institutions, 
And in fact, they can be seen as members of a special interest group. And this already was a, a concern raised by John Dewey um, in the early part of the 20th century um, when he, uh, when he uh, warned against techno technocratic rule in the public and its problems, uh, the, the public and its problems. Um, so um, uh, we have to find some way around this accountability, sorry, this um, authority uh, autonomy conflict. Now, um, the sim let's talk about the simple solutions, simple, uh, uh, so to speak. Um, option one, uh, epistemic anarchism, right? Uh, now, I use this term epistemic anarchism. Uh, I don't mean the epistemological anarchism defended by Paul Feyerabend, and famously in Against Method, um, which argues that uh, the, the, the one methodological principle for science is uh, anything goes. Um, this, I think, actually has little to do with um, uh, political anarchism. It's not what I, not what I mean. Um, Instead, I want to think about anarchism, uh, epistemic anarchism, by analogy to the way that Robert Paul Wolf defines political anarchism. So Wolf defines political anarchism simply as the denial that there is any authority over your conduct besides, uh, in, in the Kantian way he understands this, the moral law, right? So we have, you know, ethical obligations, right? We have... Um, uh, we have moral obligations that are that are determined by uh, individual ethics, but there's no sort of social institutions that have um, uh, additional authority over your conduct. Um, on that on that line, epistemic anarchism similarly denies that any um, any there are any special authorities over your beliefs or acceptance of claims over and above what you can judge for yourself using ordinary epistemic norms. Um, epistemic anarchism, among other things, entails a strongly curtailed authority for scientific experts. They would, of course, be listened to, but only as any special interest group would. Um, as it happens, epistemic anarchism is also a view that has been um, received maybe its strongest uh, defense from Paul Feyerabend, um, not uh, as the primary thesis of against method, which is again, is epistemological anarchism, but in uh, other works in uh, primarily in the 1970s, such as how to defend society against science and science in a free society. So what, ep what epistemic anarchism would require uh, is um, formal separation of science and the state, um, no special role uh, for or support of science by the state, um, the right of each person to decide for themselves in epistemic matters, um, as I said, no special funding for mainstream science, um, they might they might compete for fund mainstream science might compete with uh, for funding with other groups, but would have no special access to funding um, and a more engaged uh, and mature democratic citizenry that was um, ready and able to make the kinds of um, decisions uh, that it would require um, absent def deference to epistemic uh, authorities. Okay. Um, the benefits of epistemic anarchism, um, it would ensure that public values are in place by placing the, the moment of judgment in the, public, in the public's hands, right? Um, it fits better with a participatory democratic ideal, right? Um, uh, the, the public uh, participates in decision-making at, at all levels, including um, uh, decision-making about what claims to accept. Um, avoids problems of illegitimate technocracy and paternalism. Um, uh, by the way, it also preserves academic freedom and the right to science by, um, uh, by ensuring the autonomy of science from the public. Um, and it provides equal standing for various local situated indigenous and alternative forms of knowledge um, along with mainstream Western academic science. Um, so these are the benefits. 
Um, the drawbacks of epistemic anarchism. Um, in the absence of legitimate authority, Ill illegitimate coercion tends to arise. This is a problem uh, that political anarchists uh, have to address. Um, and it's also a problem that epistemic anarchists would have to address. Um, inefficiencies and bad decisions are likely as ordinary individuals are prone to mistakes, um, perhaps arguably more so than experts, although I think that's a controversial point. Um, the public is not always going to make the right decision. Um, uh, if uh, more of the responsibility lies in their hands. Um, it also d diminishes um, the role of science as, as public reason, which many have thought are, is, a, is a crucial political role for science. Um, and it places a heavy burden on individual uh, citizens to be well-educated and to participate in these kinds of decisions. Option two, um, strong accountability. And I just wanna remind you here, I'm, I'm exploring the space of responses at the extremes for the moment. So the first extreme was epistemic uh, anarchism. The second extreme is uh, what I'm calling strong accountability. This I think is the more popular view in the literature um, on values in science and science and, and policy making, especially those who connect those two. Um, but I think that we tend not to recognize just how radical um, a change strong accountability would be as compared to the, the status quo. So I wanna try to emphasize that and also some of the problems here. Um, I'm quoting again from uh, uh, Heather Douglas, um, uh, continuing the quote uh, we were talking about before, right? Um, we said, um, uh, she said that an autonomous and authoritative, uh, authoritative science is intolerable. Um, and it's in part because the if the values that drive inquiry are in inimical to society, the surrounding society is forced to accept uh, those claims with no recourse, right? Um, and uh, Douglas points out that critics of science have attacked the most obvious aspect of this issue first, science is authority, right? So that's, who, that's the epistemic anarchist attacks science's authority. Um, yet science is stunningly successful at producing accounts of the world. Critiques of science's general authority in the face of its obvious importance seem absurd, right? Um, the issue that requires serious uh, examination and reevaluation is not the authority of science, but its autonomy, right? So this is just showing here uh, uh, that this is um, Douglas's solution to the problem and um, one that uh, uh, to her credit, she explores not only at length at the end of the book, um, but also uh, uh, in, in theory and in practice in subsequent work. Um, but I, I still, I think uh, we need to think about the, the, the radical nature of this solution to the problem. Um, so the idea seems to be that we can sort of take um, values from uh, the public, the public, and um, replace the idiosyncratic values held by scientists in order to achieve, uh, in order to achieve legitimacy for policy relevant science. Um, and we avoid uh, any problematic um, uh, influence of the public over science because it's the values and not the beliefs that we're importing from the public. Um, of course, this picture is too simplistic in a variety of ways. Um, um, you know, I think one worry is that it basically has the converse of the problem that the deferred decision response uh, of the uh, that I associate with the democratic objection has. Um, so, um, you know, rather than the idea that there are value-free facts that we can bring to policymaking, um, uh, it, it, uh, to be combined with them in order to generate policies or actions, um, this assumes that there are kind of fact-free values that um, are can be kind of uh, settled by the public uh, in an undisputed way and then carried over into inquiry without any kind of relationship to the facts that they're going to combine with. Um, I think this this kind of um, 
you might call it hypostatization of values, right? Um, uh, but just does it gets the phenomenon wrong, right? Uh, facts and value, factual and value judgments evolve; they co-evolve, right? Um, and they're they're you know situationally sensitive. Um, so I think that's that's not a very realistic uh, approach. Um, a more realistic approach, uh, one that um, uh, Heather Douglas points to in Science Policy and the Value Free Ideal is um, the uh, United States National Research Council report uh, framework, Understanding Risk, the so-called Orange Book framework, um, which is, a, a, they call it an analytic deliberative framework that involves sort of multiple feedback loops and interactions between public officials, natural and social scientists and, and stakeholders, right? Or, um, interested and affected parties on the diagram here. Um, but this is a very demanding, uh, this is a very demanding approach. Um, uh, and I think that's, that's gotta be considered. So, but this would be, this would perhaps be a, a more realistic approach to a strong accountability, uh, type of, uh, type of view, right? So what are the requirements of strong accountability? Well, um, among other things, you'd need a radical shift of, of the scientific research agenda in favor of public interest science, right? Um, science that can be used um, uh, by the public um, and not, not to various private interests, which are gonna have that distorting effect. Um, uh, you need to have a lot of scientific involvement in the scientific process in those analytic deliberative processes um, and, and oversight over um, decisions made in the scientific process. Um, and you're going to need mechanisms of authorization and accountability for policy relevant science. Um, the benefits of strong accountability are uh, that it retains the intuitive authority given to scientific experts and the scientific process. Um, it fits within um, the structures of representational democracy that are familiar. Um, it preserves the role of science as public reason. Um, it reorients science from private interest and the attendant problems of pro private interest science to public interest science. Um, and I, we, I think we can point to the strong track record of mission-driven public interest science uh, as an argument for why strong accountability might be more plausible than uh, it's been given credit for, right? Why, why um, uh, strong accountability is not going to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. Um, but there are drawbacks to strong account accountability as well, um, including um, that strong accountability requires the creation of new consultation, authorization, and regular regulatory structures or institutions for science. Um, uh, the second is that it pushes against institutional tensions between science and politics. It forces things together that um, uh, uh, traditionally have not known how to mix. Um, and it places a significant burden on uh, scientists to um, have their work reviewed and, and consulted on um, in various ways um, that may prove, may prove difficult. Um, all right, uh, so those are, the, those are the extrema, so to speak. Those are the, those are the um, views that uh, sort of naturally follow from this two-sided tension. And now the question is, um, can we find a third way, right? I don't have time to fully explore this idea, um, but let me gesture briefly at, um, at the third way, um, which we might call democracy as collective inquiry, uh, or um, we might combine that notion with a notion of science-informed policy as interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, uh, but the, the idea is, um, are as follows. Um, and here I'm, I'm building on a long tradition of sort of pragmatic um, theory of democracy and um, uh, uh, deriving from Dewey um, uh, and others, uh, which, which actually 
lead us to reconceive of the the function of democracy itself as a way of uh, uh, creating collaborative inquiry into shared social problems, um, as opposed to conceiving democracy in sort of formal terms as certain kinds of, of voting mechanisms and so forth. Um, and uh, I think we can combine that notion with uh, the notion of um, science informed policy as interdisciplinary inquiry. Um, so, so my idea uh, there is that we reconceive policymaking not as something that falls in a in a sort of sphere separate from science, but as a as a kind of inquiry that is cooperative between scientists, uh, natural and social scientists, policymakers um, as well. Right. So they're all these are all kinds of experts that come into the picture to form policy. Um, possibly also with input from public, uh, the public or stakeholders, um, and possibly even there's a role uh, for philosophers here um, uh, as well, um, in uh, philosophers of science as well, in, in kind of creating uh, the conversation. Um, now, in a third way like this, uh, uh, the in a sort of democracy as inquiry third way, I think uh, we would reconceive expert authority on autonomy um, in a way that maybe combines the best of both worlds. Um, in terms of authority, right, we would continue to recognize a special authority of scientists within their area of expertise, according to a kind of cognitive division of labor. Um, but that authority would be um, a very situationally specific um, uh, would be subject to, sorry, a very situationally specific evaluation and renegotiation of its relevance and standing on a case by case ba basis, right? So the authority of of scientific experts um, is going to be um, um, tentative, right? Um, and uh, sort of uh, up for renegotiation as we sort of dig into the issues. Um, and in of autonomy, right? Specialist or technical or basic or private interest research will remain relatively autonomous. Um, but policymaking inquiry must be appropriately authorized, accountable, representative, uh, etc. All right, so that's um, that's uh, where I am with that. Thank you, everyone, for giving me a chance to to talk about that. Um, so let me turn this off so I can see your faces. Um, thank you, Matt, uh, for your presentation. Thank you so much. So I am inviting everyone to um, uh, ask a question. And again, you can use a chat or you can use the uh, raise your hand feature. Uh, and I will try to alternate the questions between what pops up in the chat and uh, what people want to address in a in a more direct way. Okay, I see there are a couple of hands up. Oh um, yes, so we have uh, PD Magnus and uh, Paul, and I didn't notice who was first. To be honest, I think it's PD. Okay, PD, go ahead. Yeah, I just put my hand up so that I'm in the queue. I don't always mean to be at the front of the queue. But uh, thanks, Matt. So I was wondering, it seems to me that the three options you present, um, anarchism, strong accountability, and collective inquiry, um, might well just be appropriate in different cases, right? So for questions that you might think of as religious or personal, it seems like we just actually do respect epistemic anarchism. People get to believe whatever they want. Um, and for questions of, say, in, uh, environmental policy or management of particular environmental, like particular locations, the environmental management of a particular location, it seems like strong accountability is the right model. You really want to be in consultation with the locals. Um, but for broader questions, um, which are like less local and less imminent, but which still have policy consequences, it seems like some kind of uh, collective inquiry model is appropriate. Do you think that's right? Or do you think collective inquiry really is just the right model for all cases? Yeah, good question. Um, so, um, I, I, I mean, I do think that there are, um, 
Certainly, I think there there are all kinds of questions that we think um, some kind something like epistemic anarchism is appropriate, right? Um, uh, I, you you mentioned religious questions, which I think is a good example. Um, you know, I I think um, to to some extent, though, um, you know, the the institutions of science informed policy making um, do kind of presuppose um, uh, certain broad philosophical commitments of these kinds. Um, and uh, um, I, I think it, it's it's not so easy to be totally f flexible about them, right? So I, I think that the, the most sort of compatible approach with what you're saying is the kind of democracy as inquiry approach because um, it can uh, it it can kind of um, it can kind of ratchet up or ratchet down the um, amount of oversight right um, in a situa situationally specific way right um, whereas if if sort of if it's strong if it's strong accountability. Um, built into your your institutional structures right then um you know you might have a presumption of uh um uh, uh of sort of guidance and control that's that's too strong for the situation i don't know i have to think more about that it's it's a good you know um the move from kind of the big framework to more sort of retail oriented questions or or, or situationally specific questions is a is a good thought so let me let me think more about that um yeah um next question is from paul franco yeah thanks matt um i wonder if you thought about how to uh, structure this sort of um interdisciplinary uh inquiry in ways in which uh the scientists uh and other relevant experts don't just sort of dominate the conversation in a certain way right um so i'm thinking of examples from uh, some people's work uh, like john rosenberg is here and like ben Polly about cases in which there has been this sort of collaboration between scientists and and the community but the the scientists end up right ultimately dominating everything that that goes on so i wonder if you thought about uh, how to address those kind of kind of issues yeah 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 no that's a that's a really uh a good question and um i think you know w one thing that i one one idea i've explored in relation to that is sort of um reframing the idea of um of expertise right so that it's you know we don't say Okay, the scientists are the experts, and then there are the policymakers, right over here, um, the, the 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 representatives and the and the and the um, people working um, in the regulatory agencies and so forth. What you have is you have you know two types of experts who have a, have uh, expertise in different areas, right? So the 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 policymakers are um, you know experts on um the, the kind of means and ends of of uh of policy making um the the public are experts on um their particular local situation right um and so they have an expertise that needs to be recognized um i mean that's a i mean that's that's partly just rebranding uh the notion of expertise but um i think you know what it signals what really you need is um, everyone to meet each other on equal footing. Uh, now, what I don't have, and I think partly what you're asking for, uh, is more practical strategies for getting from where we are to getting to that kind of mutual recognition. Um, and uh, I'm not there. I have. I don't have anything really clever to say there yet. Um, um, Justin, you're next with your question. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I think I'm having a little bit of trouble wrapping my mind around this because I'm having some trouble under just 
wrapping my head around the idea of science being authoritative um, and what that actually means. Um, and partially it's for reasons having to do with sort of context dependence, which, you know, PD was, was talking about. Um, but also just, I mean, you know, we can think of um, various respects in which science might be authoritative. I mean, we might say that, um, you know, we as believers ought to defer to scientific experts under certain types of conditions when you have certain kinds of consensus and, and things like that, which is sort of broadly to say that science is a better way of gaining knowledge about the world than like witchcraft or reading tea leaves or what have you. Um, and it's another thing to say that science um, should be authoritative in the sense that we should have small cabals of scientists making, you know, mandating decisions about policies and things like that, which seems to be the thing that Heather is worried about. But that strikes me as maybe a straw way of, 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 of thinking about this. Um, um, certainly that's, well, yeah. Um, so can you just say a little bit more about um, maybe sort of different respects in which science might be authoritative and, and um, how, how you mean that? Yeah, good. Um, so, uh, I'm think I'm thinking. So, I'm thinking about um, things like, um, you know, the the way that we treat an expert witness differently from a different kind of witness, right, in a legal case, or um, the way in which you know um regulatory science um which embeds certain kinds of value judgments is uh playing um you know playing a role in determining what the the sort of facts are right for um decision making right so um you know policy making is built on um uh, an, a sense of of like cause and effect means ends relationships, right? Um, and um, I think it's it's typical to think that um, uh, you know which claims about those relationships are accepted for the purposes of policy making is determined by the relevant body of scientific experts, right? Um, so. I, I just mean, you know, um, the fact that there, there are certain certain people who, um, who or certain groups of people rather whose claims um, uh, are deferred to. Um, that's all I mean by authority there. I don't know. Is that is that helping? Well, I mean, it just seems like the, the, the sense in which like, well, I mean, in all of these cases, we have other people at the table besides scientists and the decisions that get made are by um, political, well, in many cases, political leaders or people kind of responsive to political processes. So it's not just, you know, some scientists sitting in some room who are making these kind of decisions solely um, on the basis of their own deliberations. They're part of a, a broader pro process, which um, is, um, uh, a part of a broader political process, right? And we can so so criticize the ways in which um, politics enters into these deliberations, but it but um, it just seems to me that you know it's not just scientists making these decisions. Yeah, but I, I agree with that. But I, I think um, there there is a sense um, there is a sense by let's see. I have the sense that for a lot of people, when um, in those processes, right, when the factual claims of scientists are disregarded, that people think that's 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 a bad thing. That's an illegitimate exercise of political authority or something. The 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 the, the experts should be deferred to, right? Um, in those negotiations, not about what they think the right policy decision is, but what they are claiming the sort of cause and effect relationships are. Um, I think that that is problematized by the fact that political positions and value judgments are baked into um, the the those factual judgments, right? Um, that's so. Yes, in terms of the policy decisions. 
certainly nobody thinks that the experts are there just making all the decisions by themselves. But um, I think the people making the democratic objection have a reasonable concern that um, they, they might nevertheless be smuggling sort of inappropriate uh, uh, coercion into the process. That's my thought. All right, thank you. Um, next is a uh, comment and question uh, from Karen uh, de Olivares, and she's wondering uh, whether we can consider science as a homogeneous entity. Yeah, I mean, yeah. no, not really. Um, but uh, there's a lot of ways in which um, the um, sort of formal role for science in political or policymaking processes um, is uh, pretty homogeneous, right? So, um, you know, um, uh, you know, sociology and, um, you know, microphysics work very different from one another, but, um, you know, expert witnesses in either field are treated basically the same, right? In a court, in a court proceeding, right? If they're authorized by the court as an expert witness, right? Then um, uh, they are they are they are treated roughly the same. So, uh, I think there are kind of formal or high level properties of uh, the role of science in society that can be treated um, abstractly, you know, even though the underlying science uh, is not a homogeneous entity and, and works in a lot of different ways, right? And maybe under um, a, a notion of, of sort of um, democracy as inquiry or, or uh, science-based poli science policy as, as inquiry, um, uh, that might start to come apart and the and the relevant epistemic differences between different sciences might be recognized uh, a little bit more. I, I guess I was thinking not so much in terms of academic disciplines as being um, different, um, in, but in terms of the generation of knowledge based on the funding sources and and how that whole process works. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of of the values that get expressed or or repressed in some cases. Yeah, yeah. no, I mean, I mean, that's um, that's something that we should have that I think we don't have enough of right now, right? So, um, you know, in, in particular, we, you know, I think we don't treat. Um, You know, so, so like some regulatory science is publicly produced, um, but also a lot of regulatory science is produced by um, the the people being regulated, the private interests being regulated, right? Um, take medical research, for example. Um, uh, so, um, so yeah, I, I think again, um, these are the kinds of distinctions that once we kind of reject the um if we reject the sort of all things you know sort of extreme um authority uh, authority or or autonomy of science we can start to recognize some of these differences okay so we have um one minute left so matt um one last question uh Sure. Okay, so uh, Deepan Wita um, has a question for you. Okay. Hi, Matt. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, uh, it is one minute, so I'll try to keep it brief. Um, talking about your collective inquiry, the third model, I often talk to the scientists at my university quite a bit, especially the chemistry. And I noticed that scientists actually have multiple voices in the sense that the more senior and the more famous they are, 
their concerns are no longer with particular research projects. Rather, they think about the future of their discipline. And I'd like to make a quick, give a quick description of a talk I'd been earlier this month. Roald Hoffman, he's a Nobel laureate chemist, very well known as a poet, playwright, everything. And he gave a talk um, at our university, of course, by Zoom, on simulation and understanding. And by simulation, he meant for nuclear chemists, they are making, beginning to make models of different kind of patterns which give great predictability, but no understanding. So most of the time he was talking about a Faustian bargain between power and understanding. But the problem is the scientists do, especially the very senior of them, do rise to that level. But after some time, there is a collective hand wringing by the younger ones. They say, what can we do? We have to now go back to our lab. So as you talked about the collective inquiry, I wonder if as philosophers of science or other interested parties, it is those moments we can engage with and come out some concrete proposals and policies because scientists are interested in philosophical topics. It's just that they can stay there for a long time. The professional demand is too great, but that's what I think we can engage with and come back with something in terms of teaching, research, collaboration, and that way build a very small uh, nucleus of collective inquiry. So that's 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 a project or a program. I was thinking if we could all start in different ways. Thank you for that uh, suggestion, Deepan I, um, um, well, I, I just, just in interest of time, I'll say, I think that's an interesting um, uh, possible starting point for this kind of discussion, for sure. All right. Um... Thank you, everybody. Um, Matt, thank you for your talk. And uh, we'll have now uh, a break until 12.05. Um, and um, we will have lunch break first, and then we will meet for the um, networking session, um, which will start at, um, at uh, 1 p.m. So we will have lunch break right now, and at 1 p.m. we are meeting back here to engage in discussions in small groups. Okay, so we'll see you all in, a, in about an hour. <laughs>